uh, discussion on uh, medical ethics. And I want to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Arun Agarwal and uh, Dr. Gunjan Pradhan for uh, being with us uh, as uh, uh, the main speaker and the panelist today on this uh, important uh, discussion. As you know, the VIF in the past has uh, held several discussions on dharma and its importance and uh, 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 to its life. And we have uh, organized this talk uh, as a uh, part of that series of uh, discussions and lectures that we have been having. And I want to thank uh, Gunjan for giving uh, this idea, uh, for uh, uh, inviting Dr. Agarwal uh and re requesting him to talk about uh, the medical ethics uh, in general uh dr agarwal is uh, a well known uh, uh, practitioner of ent and also uh, he has been involved with the uh, uh, medical ethics and discussions surrounding med medical ethics in public policy for a number of years. And uh, he has uh, uh, been, uh, he is the president of Delhi Council of uh, Physiotherapy and uh, Occupational Therapy. Uh, he's president of Sound Hearing 2030. He is a former dean of, and professor of excellence in the department of ENT, Malana Azad Medical College. His medical, he was medical advisor Innovation, Education, and Clinical Excellence, Apollo Hospitals. is uh, Honorary Advisor, uh, NBE, at uh, Faculty Development Program. And he's, uh, uh, he was ex-Additional Director General, Health Services, uh, Government of India. And uh, he was also former President of the Delhi uh, Medical uh, Council. And he has also been involved with uh, uh, international discussions on uh, medical ethics. Uh, you know uh, Dr. Gujar Pradhan, she has uh, been uh, a part of our several discussions uh, uh, earlier. And uh, she is uh, herself uh, an author and she has written extensively on uh, Indian philosophy. Uh, she has also taught Indian philosophy at, at Delhi University, St. Stephen's College. And uh, some uh, weeks ago, and organized a book discussion on her book uh, uh, on uh, Dharma. So today we have uh, a, an occasion to uh, discuss uh, what is the role of uh, medical ethics in uh, uh, public policy? What is the role of uh, ethics in uh, our daily acharan and vyavahar? You know, we have seen uh, some months ago uh, disturbing videos of how uh, doctors, nurses, uh, medical staff, etc., were treated uh, in the uh, various uh, hospitals uh, who were at that time when the COVID had just struck and we were trying to organize our response. Uh, the, uh, the bond between the patient and uh, the doctor is uh, very sacred and uh, very important. And in fact, uh, our society uh, really depends on the health of this bond. So what role does uh, uh, medical ethics play in the uh, uh, medical profession? We are also now working on uh, uh, the uh, corona vaccine, coronavirus vaccine. And we already see a lot of discussion uh, that is happening uh, all around the world, including in India as to uh, what will happen after the vaccine uh, is uh, uh, produced. Because how the vaccine will be uh, brought to the market, how it will be distributed, what will be the uh, excess uh, affordability, et cetera. Uh, these are also important issues, which are not just uh, medical issues and commercial issues, but also certain ethics uh, is involved. And of course, in our country, uh, we have uh, so many people who have no access to uh, medical facilities or to medicines, etc. Uh, and yet they require uh, all the help and uh, sympathy that is uh, so essential 
So I think there are many issues uh, of uh, ethics uh, which are involved here. And uh, in our own uh, ancient uh, culture, there has been a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, ethics, uh, particularly in the context of uh, medical profession. So we will discuss uh, these issues today. And uh, now I request uh, uh, Dr. Agarwal to uh, kindly uh, uh, share with us uh, his views. And uh, after uh, uh, he has spoken, then I'll request uh, Dr. Gunjan Pradhan to uh, be a discussant and give her views, and then we can uh, open it up for discussions. So thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for being with us today, and thank you for joining us despite your uh, busy schedule. Uh, may I request you to kindly uh, make thank your remarks? Thank you, Arvindji. Thanks to you. Thanks to your entire team for giving me this opportunity to talk about medical ethics and especially at a time medical ethics is no doubt it's the most important uh, understanding is the most important science between the doctors and the society and that is what uh, we have to understand but during last four months perhaps during the covid time this ethics has shown certain ups and downs, and that is what it is important for us as a medical professional person to understand, as well as for every member of the society to understand that what if there is something going on wrong, what is wrong and what way we can improve, because this situation of COVID-19 was an unusual, it is an unusual situation for all of us. So while uh, we talk uh, about it again while thanking you. Uh, Arvindji, um, um, uh, I know that you have written many publications and you have also mentioned in your Vasudeva Kutumbana the relevance of Indian ancient thinking to contemporary strategic reality. Of course, the medical ethics is there for years and centuries, and we talk about BC and medical ethics is still existing. But what we had in the past and what we are doing now is the matter of relevance. That is what I will be covering. Uh, um, is Arpita, Arpita, can I have the liberty of changing the slides? Is that okay. fine, sir? Yeah. yeah. Yes, perfect. You yeah, just right. say you just say next, and uh, Abhijit oh, will oh, move oh. the slides. Yeah. Thank you very much. You see, I like to first cover up the medical ethics from modern system point of view. Then I'll talk a little bit about the medical ethics of ancient India, and then we'll proceed further. It is very important for us to understand that. Uh, what is medical ethics? And there is no doubt uh, that uh, ethics is concerned with morality, it is concerned with values, and it is concerned with standard of conduct. While we are talking about conduct, it basically covers many things, including the subject ability also. Next slide. And it includes the medical etiquettes, conventional laws, custom of courtesy, code of conduct governing the relationship between physician and his professional colleagues. In recent time, medical ethics has been greatly influenced with the development of human rights. The physician frequently have to deal with medical problems resulting from violation of human rights and the medical ethics is also closely related to law. There are rules and regulations laid down in our IPC and in what way it gets affected and affects the medical profession, what I'm going to discuss. Next slide, please. The ethical principles such as the respect for persons, informed consent, confidentiality are the basic to the physician-patient relationship. And the study of 
ethics prepares medical profession to recognize difficult situations as to deal with them in rational and in a principled manner. Next slide. We understand that the principle of uh, medical ethics as regards the modern system is concerned is A, B, C, D, E. The autonomy, beneficence, confidentiality, do no harm and equity or justice. That is what has been described by the father of modern system of medicine who gave the concept of ethics that is Hippocrates. It happened four to fifth century before Christ. And I would like to explain perhaps each one of them. Next slide. Autonomy is basically freedom to the patient. The freedom to the patient for thought, intention and action when making decision regarding healthcare process. When for a patient to make a fully informed decision, that means the doctor is supposed to inform each and every detail of the disease, give options, and then he or she will decide about how to proceed further. It includes need to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, and be faithful to on own commitment. Whatever you say, you should try to commit that. Next slide. Of course, the beneficence is nothing but the patient's welfare is the first consideration. Next. Confidentiality. Anything in relation to the patient is a perfect understanding between patient and a doctor based upon royalty and trust. Maintenance of confidentiality of all personal medical and treatment information. Next, do no harm. That is one of the fundamental and the <coughs> above all, do no harm. Make sure that procedure does not harm the patient or any other in the society. But there are certain, I always say, Arvindji, that medical science is never two plus two, four. Sometimes it becomes three, sometimes it becomes five. But what is more important that patients should know that in what way it can bring variation. For example, if for alleviation of the pain, morphine is given to a patient who is dying, who is having severe pain, but the morphine may bring depression of the respiratory system and that may lead to death. That means anything which is having beneficial effect as well as it has got a very strong side effect that is what we call double effect. But everything should be clarified either to the patient or his close relations or legal survival. Next slide. And of course, equity of justice, fair and equal distribution of scarce health resources, decision of who gets what treatment. The typical example in a scenario of casualty. In most of the hospitals, the casualty is always full of patients. And that casualty may have patients of acute nature, patient of subacute nature, and obviously there are few patients who feel, let us walk in into casualty and get our routine problem treated. So the, here comes the principle of triaging, where we triage that acute, the person who is having acute problems should be treated first and accordingly triaging is done. Next slide. For this medical ethics, needless to say, Every one of us know the Hippocratic Oath. We, the medical student, when I took over, when I did my graduation from King George's Medical College in 
before that, after that, and there are so many medical codes which have come from time to time, but basically the basic concept of Hippocratic Oath remains the same what we have discussed earlier. Next slide. The Hippocratic Oath. As a medical graduate, we always sign a document mentioning all the aspects of Hippocratic Oath. Next slide. And latest Medical Council of India, which is responsible not only for the registration of medical professional, but they are also responsible for professional conduct etiquettes and ethics keep updating and the last amended was in 2010 and recently also they keep changing from time to time next slide let me go back to Ayurveda the most understood science of 2000 year or even before that, India's richness was ancient science of life, Ayurveda. There are many names attached to Ayurveda. Charak is one of them, Susruta is another one, and those so many. And the basic ethics of Ayurveda includes many things, but Arveda deals with preservation of good health, that is preventive aspect of health and combating disease. Need for healthy lifestyle, it, the various components, cleanliness and purity, good diet, proper behavior, mental and physical discipline. And Arveda tend to treat a patient as a whole. Next slide. Many of you may not be knowing, even I also came to know recently that Charak Samhita, which is the most important document as regards the ancient medical ethics is concerned. When was it written? It is only speculated, perhaps it was written before Christ, two, one to two century before. Where was it written? It is also a speculation, but I came to know, Arvindji, that there is a place in Uttarakhand which is 250 kilometers away from our Delhi capital city in the near Lansi Down. There is the Charak Peak, and this was the platform where Charak Samhita was written. It becomes a very important place for all the medical professionals like us even for the society. Next slide. And if we go through the details of Charak Samhita, it has given the characteristic of a medical student. If I go through the list, it creates the perfect person, the perfect person who can devote his life for, as a doctor for treating a patient based upon the humanitarian ground with with perfect science i like to compare both the ancient ethics versus the modern ethics next what happened i like to share with you this is what the ancient medical science is concerned but in india also when we started our medical education of modern system, when did we start? We, start. we started. The first medical college of India started in 1835. That means 185 years back. The first medical college of India was Calcutta Medical College. during British regime. I like to give few names which followed that. 
And surprisingly, this medical college started on 28th of January, 1835. And the next slide, you, if you can show, after seven days of this college, it started Madras Medical College on 3rd of February, 1835, a big competition between two places. And next, if you can show me quickly, this was the Grant Medical College in 1845. And next, in 1860, we had King Edward Medical College, Lahore, in 1860 in undivided India. And then KGMC, King George Medical College, where I have studied. And one more example I'd like to give you, the one, the Lady Harding Medical College in 1916, which started. Why I gave you this little bit historical aspect? that around two centuries ago, we started the education of modern system of medicine. The status of medical ethics of that time versus beginning of next century, versus when I passed out in 1972-73, versus today, there is a gradual change. Why it is so? We'll discuss. Next slide. And now today, more than 500 medical colleges and National Board of Examination Accredited Hospital all over India. Quality of doctors is an issue. What is happening to us? Medical education of yesterday was within the domain of a national bounty. We were within India, within our own domain. But today, the medical education has become boundaryless. There is an influence, positive or negative, but the fact is there is influence. Next slide. The clinical skill of doctors is becoming fossilized. We are depending on more of technology art of science and medicine is turning into mechanicalized. It is totally mechanized. Next, please. Due to explosion of knowledge today, every day the knowledge is changing. Whatever we learn today, within six months, there is something new. So the old knowledge goes into graveyard. The technology has changed doctors loving touch and clinical skill. It, they have lost it. The medical education has hampered by lack of latest technology. Are we churning out mechanical robot dependent on computer and the navigation tool? Next slide. Faith. Here I would like to mention the faith is a very important part of our understanding with the society, with the patient. But ultimately, considering certain factors, what happened to us? We were not able to deliver the best possible solution. And society started looking for alternative system of medicine. And to the extent when an institution like National Institute of Health in the United States, which is supposed to be one of the most important institute for medical research, they started having funding for the medical research like acupuncture for depression, biofeedback for pain control, Ayurvedic medicine for Parkinsonism, hypnosis for healing broken bone, Music therapy for brain injury, massage therapy for post-surgical patients, yoga for addiction and obsessive convulsion disorders. I mean, the, somewhere we failed in producing and giving best to the society. And that is why society started thinking about alternative system of medicine. Next. I would like to share with you 
it is always important for us to understand what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses. We understand that the strength of modern system of medicine, the drug formula, the antibiotic, the vaccines, we are looking for vaccine for COVID-19, the advancement of surgery, transplant surgery. We are very good in emergency care, acute care, reproductive technology, gene therapy, and so many new things coming. But where we are weak, we are weak in impersonal doctor-patient relations, health wellness, management of chronic and degenerative disease, poor understanding of mind and body interaction. We have materialistic philosophy. And of course, there is no doubt there is increasing cost. Next slide. But what is there on part of society or the patient or an individual? Everybody has got expectations expectation in terms of expertise. Anybody suffering will like to come to the best possible person, having best possible technology, having a perception of a place that, well, this is the place you should go. For technology, I like to give example, Arvindji, like we know that now, robotic surgery is coming up and uh, to bring better precision. But now the perception of public getting, especially in big towns like Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai, people are coming and asking, do you have robotic surgery? If you say no, they say, okay, we'll come back. That means the technology-driven expectations. Expertise, we started with graduates, then we started with postgraduate, then we started with super specialized. And in super specialized also, now there is super, super specialization. Jokingly, I always say, as an ENT surgeon, I started with ear, nose, and throat. Now there is super specialization of ear. And one day will come when people will talk about, are you the expert of right ear or the left ear? The status symbol, where you are getting yourself treated. Are you getting treated in a government hospital or a private hospital or a hospital of repute or a hospital of five-star facility? And most importantly, in India, what is happening is the referral system. There is no referral system. Anybody can go to the best possible doctor straight away. There is no such screening of the patient right from the beginning by general practitioner or anybody who will treat the 85% problem and then do the proper referral to the person who can treat the patient better. Next slide, please. Ultimately, we realize that patient, though looking for, have, have got many expectations, but the target is Patient. patient wants to be well. He wants to get rid of problem. Whether it is allopathy or various system of IUs or any other modalities, any other alternative system of medicine. But unfortunately, we do not give them the platform of combined therapy, a platform, what we are mentioning, holistic medicine, 
and we are talking about holistic medicine not now we have been talking about it for decades but so far we are not able to create the actual platform of holistic medicine there is medical council of india there is ayush council I use are with the doctor cannot practice modern system of medicine. A modern system of medicine cannot person cannot practice. I use there are so many things. I wonder if somebody legally asks yoga belongs to whom? Of course, officially yoga belongs to I use, but. Don't you think yoga belongs to society? Yoga belongs to everybody. There is no clarity. Next slide, please. The medical negligence. The medical negligence is a perception which is coming up in society. I was. President Delhi Medical Council for 10 years and during my 10 years I have seen the phase where how our doctors are behaving and how the different segment of society is behaving. I always feel that there are good doctors, there are best doctors. They are doctors who are ethically absolutely correct. But we have the doctors which are perhaps away from this concept. The same is true with the society. The society, they understand. They understand that a doctor can do to the best possible, but he cannot bring wonders. But some of them become opportunist and then there is always the gap of understanding. I always try to analyze why the concept of medical negligence, which was prevalent in West, and now it is slowly, slowly being adopted by us also. Number one, high expectation of the person who is suffering or the family, or the society, and poor communication. I try to analyze complaints against doctors. And then I realize that perhaps the basic cause of unsatisfaction on part of patient is poor communication, poor communication, lack of communication, lack of reality. A doctor has got no business to say, I'll treat you 100%. As I said, medical science is never 100%. You have to give the ground reality to the person. And the ground reality is, if you explain it with all the positive and negative, perhaps the things will be better understood and the overall incidences of medical negligence, which are increasing day by day, may come down and may decrease. Next slide. So here comes that we, we are losing faith. The society is losing faith on us because of many factors they have at times it is because of us that we always give them the expectations which is beyond our own control there are part of the society they want a magical relief I mean, many a times I understand that, that why the violations are occurring at workplace in hospitals. 
if there is no success, if there is no relief, the group of relations, friends, they get violent and then they try to do anything to the doctors. And everything can be stopped if there is a proper communication between the doctor and the patient and their relation. So very strong relationship between the doctors, doctor and the patient and their families. That is what I feel. Of course, we the doctors of modern system of medicine understand that we are perhaps losing our grip. We must understand that for what purpose we had the education of medical science, basic education, postgraduate, super specialization. Are we losing the grip? We are diverting ourselves if there is, whether it is commercial angle, popularity angle, and if there is anything, as Swamiji said, you should reject it as poison if there is any such thought. And lastly, I would like to say, next slide, please. This is what I feel a medical profession should be perfect, should be confident, should have a positive energy, like Mr. Hussein Bolt while achieving the world record in 100 meters, having a smiling face and achieving his goal with nobody can be. So this is, I feel, my medical doctors should also, should have a positive energy, should have the desire to do something better for the patient according to their capability and should understand the philosophy of ancient science ancient ethics which has been incorporated. I strongly feel that the holistic medicine, the concept of holistic medicine as per law should also be brought in. We are talking about it, but through this platform of VIF, I strongly feel that if a concept of holistic medicine be legalized, that will be the biggest help for the society. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. And I'm sure others also, they would have uh, uh, felt moved by your slides and they would have felt that uh, somewhere they also relate to every word that you have uh, said because you have put it uh, very simply but uh, you have captured the essence uh, of uh, ethics in the medical profession uh, very well. As I said in the beginning, I think the, despite uh, the, some of the examples you quoted about uh, negligence and how a lack of communication often leads to problems, but by and large uh, in our society, doctors are still treated like gods. Uh, you have to just uh, stand in front of a hospital, in an OPD, anywhere, and uh, you can see on the faces of people, uh, of course, uh, the expectations that they have. Uh, the problem in our country, I think, uh, still remains uh, the accessibility uh, to the doctors and to the uh, medicines. Uh, I think uh, you made a wonderful point, something which I would have also raised this issue of uh, holistic uh, medicine. And it was uh, very nice to hear from a professional doctor that uh, you believe in that. But uh, still it begs the question, why is it that this has not happened uh, as yet? Uh, today we have, uh, you know, you hinted at it. I think uh, the professions, they develop their own codes of conduct and perhaps own vested interests, etc. But the need of the R is to uh, 
integrate all these uh, systems and basically uh, uh, integrate uh, uh, our uh, systems which have been uh, in prevalence for such a long time and also bring uh, technology into our older systems. Why is it that Ayurveda cannot take to technology? For instance? And it's really up to you doctors to really decide and change the um, education system and uh, perhaps uh, uh, add a, a few more oaths to the uh, Hippocratic oath that you uh, give to the students about the integration that you will work for a holistic mind and body uh, solutions. But anyhow, that is something that you might like to uh, answer. And uh, this point about uh, communication is uh, extremely valid. Uh, you know, when you go to a hospital and you are uh, either ill or one of your uh, near the dears is ill, you know how difficult it is to get proper uh, feedback from the doctor. The doctor comes for to the ward for a few seconds, literally, and uh, the uh, the patient or uh, the care takers are running after the doctors. Is he all right? Will he be okay? And uh, we don't get uh, that feedback. I think see that communication is, uh, communication is perhaps the most important. And now, whether this uh, uh, in this age of technology and technology, of course, uh, I would take it more as a boon than anything else uh, in this context. And technology should also uh, help uh, improve the communication. For instance, today uh, this uh, telemedicine or teleconsultations, just uh, seeing the doctor for a few minutes on the screen and talking to him, that can help a lot. So what is the progress uh, in that area? Uh, that also you might like to share. But let me now for, uh, thank you very much for this and also now go to uh, Dr. Gunjar Pradhan for uh, our remarks. And then we'll come back uh, for a uh, discussion. Yeah. Dr. Gunjar Pradhan. Um, good evening, sir. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal, Dr. Gupta, for your kind comments. I had uh, something uh, to share uh, uh, with you. Uh, can I share the screen, please? Is it possible? Hello? Uh, Krishan? Okay, anyway, I'll start. Uh, if it's possible, uh, let me know. Uh, basically, the topic that was given to me was to talk about Chikitsa Dharm. We've talked about Dr. Gupta, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Agarwal talking about you know, this uh, heavily dominated allopathic treatment system that we have today and the challenges that we face. Now, uh, I had, of course, uh, done a detailed um, study for uh, what is the Chikitsa Dharm, which is mentioned as per Charak and Sushrut. And uh, broadly, we must understand that the Chikitsa uh, Dharm is based on a presumption of uh, the human tripod vis-a-vis -vis the binary system in Western medical science. Now, in West, we must understand philosophically and originally also, right from the time of Plato and Aristotle, we only were dealing or grappling with the problem of mind and body. However, in the case of Indian system, whichever system that we may pick up, there is a tripod that is mind, body and soul. So uh, because of the presumption being different, the way that we look at a patient or the way the patient looks at a doctor also was significantly different. Of course, Ayurveda and allopathic have their own systems and principles, scientifically speaking. But there was there is a lot in the code of ethics of both Charak and Sushrut from which we can um, um, uh, draw upon and maybe build an, our own system of medical ethics, which is more rooted in the Indian system. First of all, uh, the three major points that uh, Charak and Sushrut constantly harp upon is promotion, prevention, and cure. So somehow we feel that in the West, Western system, it is more about prevention and cure, but promotion is not 
so much focused on. The reason for this is because uh, the presumption over here is that Chikitsa Dharm is to enable somebody to pursue Dharma, Arth and Kaam, which is uh, righteousness, uh, prosperity and pleasure. Uh, so all of these three need are, are to be enabled by the physician. This may come through promotion, it may come through prevention and obviously through cure. Chikitsa dharm as a moral principle is involves giving treatment and preventive care to those who pursue righteousness. Clearly, it says that giving health care is a priority to the virtuous to uphold. As moral means to ensure that not only body and mind, but also spirit remain healthy so that one can enjoy Griha dharm, Varna dharm, Ashram dharm, Swadharm and Sadharan dharm. The moral end is to promote and establish Sukh in this world and Moksha or Anand after death. Interestingly, uh, both uh, uh, Charak and Sushrut use um, Ayur uh, or a healthy life or a long life uh, and Sukh interchangeably across the text. They use Arogya, sorry, uh, freedom from disease and Sukh interchangeably across the uh, text. So that means clearly that even the freedom from disease involves the spiritual angle. We all know that uh, Ayur, uh, Ayurveda is based on a different set of principles. Uh, it involves balancing the gunas of Sat, Rajas, Tamas and, include, and seeing the human being as a combination of Prakriti and Purush. It is based on the absolute truth of Indian metaphysics of eternality of consciousness and its oneness. However, it aims at alleviating suffering and is against harsh measures for saving life. Now, this is something very uh, important and has been a matter of debate world over, which is euthanasia. And uh, uh, the Vedic text clearly is uh, seems to be against uh, 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 any kind of uh, or harsh measure that is taken, like putting a patient on ventilator or trying any kind of uh, 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 last life-saving measures, which can further uh, exacerbate the suffering. One thing that uh, we can uh, actually learn from uh, Charak and Sushrut is, uh, which I found very interesting, is that this, they distinguish between pain and suffering. Uh, both of them uh, believe that there is a uh, that there can be suffering without pain, and there can be pain without uh, suffering. For instance, what I mean to say is that one may be in pain, for instance, I may have a mild stomach ache or I may have a mild headache, but it is not so worrisome. So I'm not that, I'm not into saying that, oh, I'm suffering. Now, we may suffer without pain as has been the case with COVID-19. We all are suffering. Most of us have not contracted the disease yet, but we are suffering because of certain kind of perception that we have. and medical science has not been able to include in its code of ethics or in its dharma that this perception management also needs to be included as a part of it that yes it is a disease it is a problem but how do we deal deal with the fear aspect now this fear aspect is clearly linked to the conscious or the spirit part of the tripod uh, so uh, this is something which i really wanted to point out uh, for uh, um, uh, uh, what we can do as a policy uh, takeaway. Um, Charak, of course, uh, uh, talks about uh, the doctor not uh, taking any unrighteous act. Uh, act with it, it, arrog must not act with arrogance, must have humility, must have an undistracted mind completely focused on health. Conception and prayer for welfare of all creatures. The ecological aspect also is included here when he talks about all creatures. Now, this doesn't mean that a, a doctor of a human uh, uh, disease starts doing uh, veterinary science. The um, import over here is clearly that when we are extracting herbs or uh, using uh, uh, tools or technology for um, treatment, uh, there should not be just heavy reliance on one kind of uh, uh, treatment source. Uh, herbs, for instance, can go extinct if they are overused. 
technology will take away the personal angle in treatment, so on and so forth. So, of course, these were texts written in the first six and second century BCE, but the point is that in today's world, they what they are trying to say is that medicine should not be practiced at the cost even of the ecological balance of the society. He says that you should not desert or injure, this is Charak, your patient even for the sake of one's own life. The crisis is managed when everybody does their duty. All doctors and even the government infrastructure is supportive to its best. Uh, very interestingly, uh, they both make ahimsa in speech essential to the science of uh, treating people. It says that holistic welfare is based on holistic being. So one has to be kind in his words. Now, uh, maybe because of paucity of time or because of some other reasons, we have found uh, gradually that doctors are rather short, technical in their output, and they don't give a whole, wholesome and moderate feedback. Uh, the doctor should all uh, the treatment system over here involves the patient, the doctor, the medication, and the attendant. Uh, clearly mentioned in the Charak Samhita. Uh, on continuation of learning resonates with modern practices which we are now indulging in, already given in second century BCE, which says that emphasis on continuation of learning even after the finishing of education. Physician should regularly attend seminars and symposia to review his knowledge and to learn new things. Against corporatization of the science, he says, not to make knowledge of medicine a source of remuneration in any circumstance. Those who trade their medical skill for personal livelihood can be considered as collecting a pile of dust, leaving aside the heap of real gold. People who regard or doctors who regard kindness to humanity as supreme religion and treats his patients accordingly succeeds best in achieving his aim of life and obtains pleasure. So the moksha of the individual, uh, the enabling circumstances that the doctor provides uh, is linked to that because with a healthy mind and a body, one is able to work towards a virtuous conduct. In the process, the doctor should also work towards his own virtuous uh, conduct and consequent sukh or moksh as he sees, uh, as he uh, thinks himself to be. The process um, uh, is uh, very different from the Western system, which we have got through the Hippocratic Oath. In the West, we have uh, the mind and the body, and it is focused largely on process technology professionalism and treating the disease. The Indian code of ethics depends not only on looking at the source of pain, but also the subject. Just as we look at fear of a snake bite and that of a fly differently, so is the fear of disease that needs to be managed as per the Indian code. The Vedic text talks about pain and suffering, which I have discussed, and we need a constant equilibrium in the body. And when we find that this equilibrium cannot be attained, uh, it is said uh, clearly in the Charak Samhita that the doctor should withdraw from the situation. But telling the patient that you're going to die is not the absolutely correct situation or that what is not recommended because it talks about ahimsa in speech. The reason for this that is given or the rationale that for this is given is that one should not exacerbate the suffering, whether it is spiritual suffering, mental or bodily. So that is another uh, takeaway that uh, we must measure this uh, while Dr. Agarwal has talked about truth and telling the truth, which we all want to know about our uh, loving ones. Uh, there are two types of truth. One is the truth that is related to semantics. That is, it is raining outside. I look outside and I say, oh, yes, you are speaking the truth. It's raining outside. But there is also the truth with a capital T, which is the universal soul. So we need to balance the truth with the small t and the truth with the capital T in order to uh, give the right picture, be communicable. And that is what uh, Indian dharma uh, tries to uh, aim at. Doctor-patient relationship needs to go beyond diagnostics, pain management, and medication. The doctor must recognize that he serves 
as a repository of trust for the patient and the patient too must respect his expertise. Moreover, the human angle of the disease must be addressed, which suffers with corporatization of medical treatment. Example, number of surgeries a day, appointment targets, etc., have reduced patient doctor interaction time and consequently its own disease is only seen as an iota oh there is an iota there's a problem we deal with it we deal with the disease the person related to the background the concept of family doctor has almost disappeared this is a big blow to the way the society has turned into because the family doctor was one who served as a repository of knowledge of genetics of generations of people. So it may he may serve three generations together. And this is uh, mentioned uh, in the text also that the doctor must be visiting certain houses regularly to give treatment uh, and uh, uh, consequently serve not only as a, a, a mind and body healer, but also as uh, giving spiritual comfort. Uh, COVID and medical ethics, I would like to say, it's a situation of apada or an apadharma for physicians is to save life of individuals with minimal suffering. Must not back off even if external support is minimal. While focus on process, prevention, treatment, etc., supply of medical goods is important. If there is a gap because we are in a crisis, it can only be filled with the human by the human angle. This is very much akin to uh, going to war, uh, where you know um, ultimately what happens, you may get back up, uh, you may not get back up, but you have to fight the battle. Uh, in conclusions, I, I, I would like to say that uh, there are certain lessons for the future. Uh, holistic me medicine is just being talked about, but whether it's in practice is a big question mark. The psychological aspect, pain management, suffering management, has yet not percolated uh, to uh, the level of the patient. Uh, focus is on medicine for man and not man for medicine. A lot of doctors consider themselves as unrelated and unavailable for service, given that their specialization was not linked to the nature of the pandemic. Sadly, the corporatized world, corporate, cor corporate world, treatment into packages. Some kind of regulation in form of Indian code of ethics is necessary to prevent milking from actually a natural disaster. This emanates from the basic flaw of seeing the disease as an opportunity and not the diseased as a human soul. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's what I want to just say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gunjan, for uh, raising uh, uh, many issues. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Agarwal uh, would uh, respond to them. And uh, uh, you have uh, raised a very important issue of uh, the practice of family doctors uh, disappearing or has disappeared almost. Uh, and also this issue of an uh, Indian code of ethics. So now we'll leave it to uh, Dr. Agarwal to answer these questions. But let me also uh, uh, open it uh, for discussion. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, maybe uh, we can take a couple of questions uh, in one go. And Sir, I have... Yes, Arbita, please go ahead. We very uh, brief because we're running out of time. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, one comment for Dr. Agarwal. Uh, so it was a very nice presentation and I think you have rightly flagged the issue of uh, holistic medical care because we don't have a system in place in which we can actually in reality practice a holistic system. I can share my experience here. Seven years ago, I went to Ames uh, to be treated for uh, gallstone. And the young doctor simply refused to believe that homeopathy had cured a different disease of mine, which was showing in the report. He said, homeopathy is not a science. It can't cure a disease. Your report is wrong. So he made me go through, have all those reports again done through AIMS, which took three months and my gallstone got infected. So who takes the moral responsibility of this situation? That is also because the doctor failed to acknowledge that a different system can actually cure a disease. Uh, that is number one. Then I have a question and also a comment for Gunjan. Gunjan, you have also very rightly pointed out very crucial issues. My question is, you said that the Vedic system was against uh, subjecting the patient to suffering and you gave the example of ventilators. Now, the point is that these texts were written several centuries ago. 
and the question of ventilator or any of the modern technologies, chemotherapy, whatever, for instance, was out of question. So we don't really know how they would have reacted to the technological scenario now. Uh, I know that this is a very, very difficult question uh, because if, uh, say, the family of a patient or the doctors have the option of saving a life by putting the patient to the ventilator, now, whether the patient also wants to go through it, I, I have a very close friend whose father refused to take chemotherapy. He preferred to die. Uh, so these are really very difficult questions yeah. and uh, uh, okay. very difficult to answer. Yeah, all right. So, Dr. Agarwal, maybe you could... Uh, yes, I will definitely like to yeah. Yeah. Uh, few of the comments. And uh, I think I also mentioned about the concept of referral. And referral means simply the concept of a family medicine person, family doctor. Because once there was, earlier it was there, it is now slowly, slowly weaning away. But a family doctor is a person who is not only a doctor, he is a moral support, he is everything to the family. And then perhaps he can look after the family in more holistic approach, he understand the nature of the head of the family and their children, the wife, and his advice is perhaps the best. But uh, somehow it is, and that's why I strongly recommend that uh, the concept of family medicine and why should a person should go to the best possible. Believe me, Arvindji, a chest pain, left side chest pain does not mean heart attack. 90% it is something else, right? So if somebody is having chest pain on left side, should will like to run to a cardiologist and cardiologist in their own uh, thinking will like to, okay, let me work it out. And they start working up from cardiology point of view and then they say, oh, sorry, 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 it is nothing. If that is what we are lacking, we are lacking the proper um, protocol for a particular symptom or disease. Disease should be treated in a proper protocol. There is a clinical pathway. So referral, the clinical pathways, careful screening, and ultimately the person, the highest of the expertise should be the last answer. A general physician can also treat 90% of chest pain. Why should only a cardiologist should come into picture? Of course, uh, there are, um, as uh, Arpita mentioned about attitude of a doctor, a young doctor regarding homeopathy. That is what we are lacking. That is what we feel. You know what happened? Um, when before British era, we were having a good control of ancient system of medicine, there's Ayurveda or Yunani in our Indian scenario, and they were looking after the society. But gradually and gradually, that's why I showed you 1835, first medical college in Calcutta, because that time the entire British colony was in Calcutta, Madras and all. They developed their medical colleges in different areas and gradually and gradually now medical science and medical education institute are mushrooming like anything. They are good institute, they are bad institute, they are poor institute, they are meaningful institute. They are a combination of all. As a medical education, it, I have seen practically 50% of institute. There is a need to improve up, upon that. But a young medical graduate Denying the efficacy of any other ordinary system is unfortunate because he does not know about it. So that that, that comes the approach of or some something should be done. Have respect for other system of medicine. If that's why I I I always share with my colleagues from Arveda and all. Let us try to understand the strength of all. I know the strength, my strength. I know my weaknesses. I must understand the strength of Arveda. I must understand the strength of homeopathy. And why not? If there are, in, like, I like to give one example. 
being ENT doctor, I look after allergy. Every one of us suffers with allergic uh, nose and something like that, running nose and all. And many of the time, patient says, doctor, can I go to a homeopathy? And say, yes, I have gone through many studies and the study shows that at least more than 50% will respond well to the homeopathy. Please try it. Why not? And if you don't get relief, then you can come back. to it. That means we must inform communication and doctors should be well versed with uh, different pathies. What is the response? And the patient should be given liberty to adopt any pathy he or she wants. Unless they yes, sir. Thank you. Right? <laughs> Regarding the ventilatory support, yes, it is the biggest uh, ethical issue. Gunjan, you have very correctly raised the issue. The use of ventilators, we can debate on this for hours and hours. Arvindji, that is a big issue. Uh, I personally feel if you want to ask me, uh, the ventilatory support should be given only there is some uh, otherwise just to extend the life with suffering it is no way desirable then what is the expectation of the family what is the expectation of the relation the children the son daughters and of course unfortunately at times there is commercial which is unfortunate and i want to strongly condemn the concept of commercialization while we are putting the patient on ventilator. This should be taken care of. I have dealt as president of Delhi Medical Council and dealt with each and, each and every good name of medical professional all over the capital and NCR. And we have discussed it. But sometimes there is always uh, expectation of the family as well as uh, at times there is commercial. I would like to add something here, uh, uh, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, she asked me that during the Vedic period, there were no ventilators. So actually, the entire repository that we have of the Vedic system or whether we study the Manusmriti or any other text that we pick up, they have left us with certain universal principles. Include a sp certain specific list, which is... Uh, closed, that is not so. They have an open-ended list. The the pith of the matter is that uh, there should no be not not be exacerbated suffering to prevent death itself. So that was the idea, and that is how in applied ethics we take principles which have been ancient. Uh, to uh, employ to new terms. You are also, Arpita, have studied so much of your Gandhi when you realize that when we try to talk about Gandhian philosophy and uh, modern economics or Gandhian philosophy and technology. In Gandhiji's time, there were uh, not so much uh, technology like we have today. But uh, he was not against technology. He was against the use of technology. Similarly, the Vedic texts, as they appear, they say that technology should not be used to further exacerbate the suffering of the person. There is something like letting go. So that is what the intention was. So that means that it depends upon the intention. It mainly the intention of the treating team, treating physician, treating surgeon, the doctors, the intention. If Something can be done better for the patient. There is a chances of survival. You know, we, we are looking for brain death issue. And we know it. Once somebody is brain dead, then nobody can help anything. And that person can always... Uh, the family can give consent for organ donation. But to convince... In Indian scenario, a family that unfortunately your person is brain dead and would like to consider organ donation, unfortunately, mostly in North India, South East is still better. The answer comes, sorry, we will not like to because they have a hope that something miracle will happen. Anyhow, these all concerns are 
related to awareness, awareness of the fact. And this becomes important for all of us, every important segment of society to make people aware of certain facts, which we perhaps tend to know and ignore. The answer remains that we have to definitely add something to our curriculum. We have to add something to our ethics. And definitely we will like to advocate the holistic approach of medicine. I, I am an ENT doctor. I am a medical educationist. I have been a regulator of the councils for a number of years. I look after so many ethics committee of capital city of in India. I, out of that experience, I'm saying, well, we are going wrong somewhere and we must change ourselves and try to develop the concept of holistic medicine. Sir, there's a comment in the chat box. Eight minute, eight minute, eight minute, yeah. Uh, Prerna, please, uh, Prerna can come in now. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, since uh, I don't come from uh, the background of medicine at all, but just something I came across in my reading, and that would interest uh, the audience listening, uh, is that in 2016, uh, Johnson & Johnson, it's the world's uh, largest uh, healthcare group, and even they realized that the current system of uh, healthcare is uh, not sustainable and uh, will not function long. So uh, they uh, came to uh, four, uh, you know, major trends uh, without a timeline per se. But uh, the big one for them, which was uh, mentioned in the talk also by Dr. Agarwal and later by Gurjan, is that healthcare uh, delivery models will shift from fee for service, like you know, paying for one visit to fee for value, maybe something like a subscription that, uh, you know, the uh, medical. Uh, institute or maybe the hospital or the doctor or a clinic would you know look at you uh, on a monthly level and see uh, where exactly things are going wrong because this whole of you know fixing a broken thing i think even the west is uh, you know realizing and uh, coming to the acceptance that uh, as in the indian system you know it has to be a holistic wholesome approach so even they are looking at uh, you know combining it Maybe uh, from their angle, it's about putting it together into a feasible new model that can be supported by the private public sector. But this is something even the rest is considering. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Agarwal, the issue is that uh, I think if you speak individually to doctors, people will say, yes, holistic uh, medicine is a good idea. And all these points which you discussed, uh, you know, probably most people individually would agree. So why is it that as a system, we are not able to bring it back? Why is it that we cannot bring back the uh, institution of a family doctor? Why is it that we, why, why is it that we cannot uh, focus on uh, prevention of uh, disease rather than, you know, spend so much on uh, cure? Uh, even our DGH, uh, CGHS and other dispensaries, they focus on treating a symptom but we never tell people beforehand in these uh, uh, systems where government is spending so much money that please prevent uh, you know change your lifestyles and that will help uh, prevent uh, this disease so if uh, all this is understood then who is stopping uh, this uh, holistic uh, uh, approach uh, from uh, being uh, implemented I, I would like to comment well i agree that as uh, gunzan said promotion, prevention, and then looking after the disease, healthcare delivery and cure. <coughs> Government in their wisdom is doing promotional activity. They are trying to, if I give you example of CGHS only, you know that CGHS has created wellness center, right? Where perhaps the concept of promotional and wellness is there. But CGHS is not India. India is far beyond CGHS. India is not Delhi. India is everywhere. It is there into uh, second category cities, third categories, villages, district headquarters, remote areas, unapproachable. 
and where different programs of the government are going. Certain programs are doing well, certain programs are perhaps trying to achieve their goal, but things are improving. There is no doubt, things are improving and the health awareness activities are going on. Regarding why we are not accepting that we let us go for holistic approach, there is always a sense of competitiveness. You see, as President Delhi Medical College, I used to get complaint why this doctor has written allopathic medicine, he belongs to Arveda, he is not supposed to write. Then you go through the act, yes, act says Arvedic medicine will med medicine will be written only by the Arvedic registered doctors. So ye jo hamara driven, law driven concept hai, isko bhi hume kahin na kahin segregate karna padega. The law has to say, well, there is a concept of holistic medicine where person can look after or you try to bring every expert under one platform. That this, as I also said and Gunjan also said, ultimately patients want what? He wants cure. Who gets the cure? If I can give, I'll give. If yoga can give, yoga should give or Ayurveda or homeopathy. And there should be a perfect understanding who is the best in that. We have to need, we, we need to create that understanding among ourselves. I, as a um, part of the medical fraternity, I strongly feel that, and allopathy should take a lead because somehow today society has got faith in allopathic system or medicine. So it becomes our duty to convey this message beyond us, there is something other pathies also, and they have their own strength, let us try. And that government is also trying to bring various pathies together. And that is why Ayush is there. But ultimately, we have to discuss more and more and try to bring policies and uh, if there is a policy of creating holistic medicine and um, some, something like it has to be implemented, I'm sure it will be implemented. Okay, now we have uh, Anmol Mahajan, yes, please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, my question was actually I think I mixed up between two or three alternative treatments. But my main question was that each system of treatment has its own science behind it. So I think homeopathy, homeopathy, there are certain med. Other types of herb has its own science. How do you bring these systems together, and how do they work together? Uh, if to, uh, some researchers show that some Ayurvedic practices have adverse effects on patients taking some medical treatments, so medicines, for example. So how do you bring them together? How do they work together? That is what I mentioned, that it is very important for us to understand our own weaknesses first. We know our strength, but let us try to understand our weaknesses and others' strength. If I try to look into our strength, perhaps I will not be able to see other strengths. So it's a, I mean, it's a very difficult situation for us. But at the same time, uh, the concept of holistic medicine is that there should be an umbrella. Either you try to create one person who is a holistic uh, medicine physician or try to bring a platform where everybody is there under one umbrella and they are in perfect harmony to each other. Anmol, I would just like to say something that, you know, very frequently it happens. Uh, for instance, uh, I had severe sinusitis and I took Yunani medicine for it. And uh, the same person in Loknaik, Jay Prakash, saw my two x-rays and said, because under one, the face was completely clouded. And after three months, the face was clean. 
so person refused to accept that unani medicine had cleared my sinus just like arpita's experience now the point is that at the point when you refer to a doctor it is also that comfort level that you should have which i have been talking about i have asked doctors many time dekhiye main saath mein javan prash le rahi hu ya main saath mein choker ki chai le rahi hu will it interfere with the medicine you are giving me so there are answers most uh, allopathic doctors would say that bran tea choker is bran will not harm um, uh, if you are taking allegra or whatever so that kind of communication link and acceptability has to be there unfortunately now i find it very difficult to lay my hands on something like as simple as choker uh, because the way the society has gone we have lost our food systems we have lost our uh, old systems of medication so that is that a mindset has to be changed policy is required for that uh, otherwise the segregated ayurved ho gaya homeopath ho gaya it is not going to work okay here i would like to agree with gunjan that uh, nutrition and the type of diet somehow in allopathy system we are not able to have a good relationship with the nutrition and diet there are good relationship but the way our ancient system of medicine was based upon the nutrition and the various factors of the diet perhaps modern system should adopt it at least yeah okay is there any other question well there doesn't seem to be any other question but let me ask you uh, this point about uh, which gunjan raised about uh, need to evolve an indian code of ethics do you think uh, that is possible i mean uh, today indian code of ethics is there by mci that is modern system or uh, there is code of ethics by ayush uh, but uh, both the system have to sit together in my practical experience both of the system perhaps not trying to mix up with each other mm -hmm. they are not trying to mix up and it is but uh, some something like a think tank um a think tank like vif can also take a lead and uh, certain offices can take a lead bringing both the think uh, both the system together and of course we need evidence based medicine somehow a modern system has created more evidence and the ancient system has created more perception yadi humko malum hai ki haldi achhi hai to achhi hai yadi humko malum hai ki neem acha hai to hai लेकिन हमने उस नीम के बारे में उतने एविडेंस पैदा नहीं किए जितने कि हमको बताने चाहिए इसीलिए हम कहीं ना कहीं वीक कर जा लूज कर जाते हैं आई थिंक इट इज इम्पोर्टेंट फॉर अस टू गिव एविडेंस दिस इज अनदर क्वेश्चन एट दिस टाइम इट इज टू द ट्रेडिशनल सिस्टम्स यस आर डू आर दे एमिनेबल टू क्रिएशन ऑफ एविडेंस कैन दे पुट देमसेल्स टू टेस्ट आफ्टर ऑल that is where the technology can help after all why does haldi work i mean if you have to ask that question why does haldi work then you have to look into the haldi and its properties and the chemicals etc and uh, why does a certain diet work so you have to look into these issues and where technology can help so are the other alternative systems uh, are they uh, amenable to uh, being scrutinized Uh, yes. Also, can the system of very strict system of trials, which are there in uh, allopathy, when before a medicine comes to the market, yes, can something like I that uh, be uh, used for uh, Ayurvedic and other uh, systems also, or is not needed? Arvind ji, let me share with you my personal observation on this issue. If I discuss, which I have been discussing with my colleagues from Ayurveda. or i use and most of the time the perception is sorry we have been using it for centuries and centuries and if somebody want to use it here is the product we need not to create evidence they don't know that's part of the psychology is one part of the psychology right but uh, the another aspect is that and there are now 
there are groups, there are institutions who are trying to create evidence. But unfortunately, creating evidence, going through the entire procedure of clinical research takes a lot of time as well as a lot of expenditure. And modern the ancient system, Arveda, they don't have that type of excess money. And that is one of the hindrance factors. They are not able to create evidence. Sir, I would like to say something that when we search for neem and haldi, the first reports that we get of evidence is from the US FDA. I know. And uh, PUSA, uh, I have a scientist, a food scientist in PUSA, who's uh, actually discovered that ne uh, tulsi in its uh, uh, very mild form, just like they say, tulsi is one piece of Similarly, mm -hmm. she has found out that two drops of tulsi is more potent than having a whole bottle of tulsi uh, juice. So, okay. but That's she so. cannot That's file so for the patent because our processes are such that mm. usse research uh, sabotage ho ke ya copy ho ke us mein patent file ho gaya hai so mm. the, what has happened is that our processes are also slow so you know and this intermingling if the ayurved can't do it to produce evidence he can tie hands with the allopath or with the food scientist sitting in pusa to give him the evidence so that kind of uh, you know policy move that uh, integration, which we holistic, we have to be holistic not only in our treatment but also in our approach to formulating the policy. That is what is required. I think uh, the good news is that uh, in some of the research organization, fortunately, I am chairing their ethics committee. There are proposals coming where this such type of projects are being prescribed by their own experts. Arveda experts being monitored by modern system of medicine doctors because perhaps we understand the various parameters of the body in terms of how the medicine is acting, the blood test versus how it is affecting the heart or it is giving the status of ECG or echocardiogram versus so many other parameters. So if such type of uh, activities have started and perhaps this may lead to even uh, better research, better outcome, better evidences. And this is another approach to holistic medicine. It will take time, but I'm sure it, it will come. Every one of us has to work for it. We so should what is what is best. Dr. Agarwal, what has so far been the experience of Ayush? because this ministry has been around for a number of years now. What have they achieved so far? Ayus has created a good uh, perception as well as evidence of prevention, of uh, wellness in certain areas of body organs also, neurological, some of the GI system, it gives relief. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm using a property name. I shouldn't have used it. But if there is a product which gives you relief, it is okay. But at the same time, if I say that I'm treating cancer and my cancer patient has been treated by me, perhaps I have to rethink about the statement. There are certain systems, certain organs where Arveda is doing very well. It's doing very well in musculo, uh, muscular disorders, neurological disorders, uh, it's some sort of, uh, it is combined. It's a, it's a medicine, come all the exercises, yoga, uh, motor neuron diseases, Ayurveda. Ayurveda. Yes. Okay. They are very good. And um, that day I was visiting one of the centers of Ayurveda, which the government of Delhi has created at Najavgarh, a wonderful institute of Ayurveda. And they are doing leech therapy. Leech is old therapy where we put the leech over the wound and the leech will suck out the 
infected part of bacteria and will give healthy wound and ultimately that wound. Uh, and I have seen wonderful results in healing, not in the healing of those ulcer, which we will say, okay, let us do the surgery out of it. Healing of? Uh, non-healing ulcers. Non-healing ulcers. What, what has been in, in your own uh, field, ENT? Like, you know, people, if you read something, they say, Kaan mein kuch lesson dal or something, you know, uh, does it work in your own field, ear, uh, nose and throat? No, okay, the, uh, before that, uh, before that, I'm holding a cup in my hand. Can you see it? Yes, 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 I can. Can, can you read it? What is there? No, I don't think I can read it. Yeah, it, it, let us act towards better hearing. Okay. Let us act for better hearing. Yes, okay, okay. I am advisor to WHO on hearing. Achha. But that, so that's my passion. That is my subject passion. And uh, the putting up anything into the ear is not at all desirable. Not because desirable. Not. If you want to put anything, then the, that should not be a, a thing which may harm because as I say, today is rain. In today's day, I can put any drop, I can put any thing in As a perception, when the skin is hurt, people put oil, leafy juice, mother's milk, some cow's urine also. But ultimately, anything going inside will get stagnated, will lead to fungus mm. of the ear, which is very common, especially during rainy season. And then you may let up with fungus infection, painful ear. Okay. Right? But if you have to have drops, then I always say that you put the drop and then try to clear the drop in such a way that it comes out of it because it lubricates. The canal needs lubrication. Dry canal means a lot of itching. Some people have a tendency of itching and they try to keep anything in the ear. That is wrong. Nothing should go inside. No, no such thing by any sharp object. Maybe we'll uh, ask one more question I have, and which is about uh, the community health. Yes. Uh, and community medicine. You know, we have a huge number of people in this country and this COVID has also shown now that, uh, like in COVID, if somebody is suffering, then people can reach you at home, help you with quarantines, etc. And so, uh, how can we really improve our community health so that uh, there is a good surveillance and there's also uh, a good uh, uh, documentation of what is happening in the community? And also, how can we reach uh, uh, at least the uh, initial, uh, you know, help uh, at the doorstep before a patient has to be taken uh, to the hospital. It's a very good question and very good ob observation also, Arvindji. Um, community, in, in our system of medicine, in our curriculum, there is a subject called community medicine. Yeah. Separate department, right? And we have the expert to whom we call public health doctors. And their job is to look into anything where the public is not coming to you by virtue of the fact they don't care for it. Mm -hmm. And you have to go and tell them that this thing is important, like um, pre-maternal care or post-maternal care, the care of a child, malnutrition, yeah. diarrhea, eye vision loss, hearing loss, people will rush to hospital if they have acute symptoms. If they have acute abdomen, they will run to hospital. But in case they are having some chronic symptoms, they don't care without realizing that that chronicity of the symptom may become something serious. So the concept of awareness, the government has created so many programs, the government of India, which are being dispersed in various, uh, um, like you must have heard regarding non-communicable disease, the diabetes, the hypertension. But we have started it 
when uh, the concept of uh, this AIDS came into picture in 80s, suddenly we were alarmed. And somehow we could create a good awareness regarding AIDS. It's a success story, I all, always say. And today, when at time we used to make statements, AIDS will spread like anything. I remember 1987 newspaper, ICMR Director General making announcement by 93, one third of Indian population will suffer AIDS. What happened to the AIDS had decreased. It has decreased because we have created good awareness, good public health approach, good messages. People are aware if somebody has to suffer, he or she will suffer because they didn't follow. So there is a great importance of public health approach, making awareness, creating a system which India has created to a certain extent, but definitely it requires more and more enforcement. Yeah. So I hope uh, that uh, enough efforts are being done in that direction because that's the building block for a good, healthy India. Yes. And now with so much focus on health after this COVID, I do hope that uh, some of these... Uh, uh, you know, good practices which were there earlier, like the family doctor that you mentioned, or maybe new good practices like uh, telemedicine or teleconsultations, yes, yes. or strengthening of the community uh, medicine uh, and this holistic medicine uh, and uh, the care, you know, uh, reaching these uh, health services to the extent possible at the doorsteps or very close to the uh, house. I think that is the uh, uh, way to move forward. Otherwise, clinics will be always overcrowded. Hospitals will be overcrowded. And the referral system that you mentioned, I think that's also very I important. I think a perfect referral system, like uh, creating primary health centers. Primary health now, centers. Now you must be knowing that under the new scheme, we are going to create 1.5 lakhs uh, centers for wellness. And yeah. those wellness centers will create, will have all the facilities of looking after common diseases. And of course, um, we don't have that those many manpowers. Today, we are producing approximately 70 to 80,000 medical graduates every year, but we definitely require at least 50% more. So it is there, it is important for us to adopt the other category of the allied health worker, including Arveda or anybody else. And that is being practiced and people are coming and they are joining a community health officer, CHO's concept which government has adopted and the training programs are going on. And especially after COVID, COVID has created a different uh, uh, thinking into the mind of policymakers as well as the medical profession. Uh, our science has gone to six. You know, when something comes, like this, the evidence-based science goes away from us. We keep observing every, every day new and new things. And that is what I, I say, medicine is never two plus two, four. It's sometimes more, it is less. So it is for us to also learn some something. Uh, you must be remembering four, five years back, there was another epidemic of chikungunya where many people suffered with chikungunya like joint pain, but that chikungunya episode led to so many variations of presentation that they had suffered with very different systemic disease and they are still suffering. Otherwise chikungunya arthritis will come and go and they will get relief within a few weeks, but some of them are still suffering. So that means something was uh, not in our knowledge that uh, any virus or any bacteria may come to us in different form and we don't have any solution. And COVID has taught that thing. Luckily, as a doctor, I like to convey to you that though the numbers are increasing, but the severity is decreasing and uh, people uh, are now. Um, of course, that does not mean that we take away our precautions. We must maintain all the precautions, whatever being 
conveyed by the government and by all of us from time to time. But you should not worry. Arvind ji, I have seen that in the COVID time, we have seen that the symptoms are deteriorating. We have seen that 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 we have seen that